Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on timely notice of hearings, why it matters, and how to make it happen. I am Crystal Coble, and I will be your facilitator for today. And we have several presenters here with us that are, have lots of very important information to share about this topic. Uh, thank you all for being here, uh, to also our child welfare partners and court partners and other stakeholders who may be listening in. So we are going to go ahead and get started uh, with our introductory information as we have a few other people joining us. A little about this webinar. It was developed through funding from the North Carolina Division of Social Services by the Family and Children's Resource Program which is part of the Jordan Institute for Families here at the UNC Chapel Hill School of Social Work. Our goals for this webinar is that by the end, we hope you'll be able to understand the importance of providing notice of hearings in a timely way, as well as identify benefits of providing notice of hearings and describe strategies for making this important practice happen. Many of you have already found the chat box that we'll be using today. Uh, you'll see that there are two options for sending mes messages, either to everyone that's a part of today's webinar or to the host here at UNC. And this will be the primary way that you can communicate with us. Um, and you can use it to send in questions or, or comments during our time together. Uh, we'll try our best to answer your questions during the event. And we do have time allotted at the end of our webinar. This box sometimes does move fast, but we do have someone uh, who's going to keep track of questions so that we have them available when um, we are ready at the end to answer some questions. A little bit more about questions, since this is just one 90-minute webinar and we have over 230 people participating, uh, we know we may not be able to get to every single question, but we'll do our best while we're here together. For those questions that we do not get to, uh, we will have a follow-up document that answers questions asked during the webinar, as well as the questions that we don't get to. Uh, this document will be emailed to all registered participants, and it will also be posted with the webinar recording. And that recording will be posted both on ncswlearn.org, as well as on the Family and Children's Resource Program webpage. You can also see there are other icons that you can use to get our attention. If you click on the drop-down box next to the character at the top of the screen, you'll see other options for being able to uh, get our attention. And I also want to take this opportunity to share with you a little about those that we have registered for this webinar. Uh, we have 232 registrants and representing 76 different counties. Uh, and those include 45 direct client contact or line child welfare staff. We have 13 agency directors, uh, 105 line supervisors, 40 program managers, uh, eight uh, trainer or staff development professionals, as well as a variety of other uh, child welfare related positions. And we also have about 46 court partners and other stakeholders. So we have a variety of people here. We're very excited that you are all here uh, to learn this important information. So I will start uh, with allowing our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, so we'll start with Arletta. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arletta Lambert, and I'm the Child and Family Services Coordinator with the North Carolina Division of Social Services, which means that I do a lot of project management, especially with our federal partners. But I also get to involve, get, be involved with some special projects that are near and dear to my heart, like this one. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gail Corelli. I'm an Assistant Attorney General with the Department of Justice. And my client is DHHS Child Welfare. Hi there. My name is Gina Brown. I'm a Kinship Family Provider with the North Carolina Child Welfare Family Advisory Council. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barry Ginn, and I am both a foster and adoptive parent uh, with Wilson County and have been for the past seven years. Uh, we've had a total of 10 placements, and from those placements, we have adopted one child and have a current placement with us now. Uh, I'm also a resource parent curriculum trainer and have been for the past six years. Uh, that is our trauma-focused curriculum that we provide for our resource parents. 
and I also serve as the representative for the foster parents on the Child Welfare Family Advisory Council, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you all to our presenters for being here today for this learning opportunity. Uh, we also have support, uh, technical support from Philip Armfield and John McMahon on the line. And again, I am Crystal Coble, and I will be your moderator for today. So before we get started with our content, we do have a poll question that we would like to start with. And our first poll question, bring it up on the screen. How often do your resource families receive notice? If you could, check whichever radio button you feel most closely represents uh, the practice in your area. We do have some people participating in a group, so I'll just give you another moment to uh, check the box if, in case you have to confer with each other and decide on which one. And it looks like the majority um, of our responses uh, replied that frequently your resource families do receive notice. And um, there were even lots of people that said always. So uh, that's very good information. And uh, as we are moving into our presentation for today, uh, we'll have a few other poll questions to, for you all to answer while we're together. So I'm going to turn it over to Arletta to start with uh, Why It Matters. Good afternoon again, and that is seeing those poll results is, is great news that, that most of the audience, um, at least at this point, are at least in the sometimes or more frequently category. So. Um, but we hope that this webinar provides you with some additional information about why this is such an important topic and maybe, um, again, give you some tips on um, how to make it happen better. And so it, this topic does really um, matter. And resource families, which in case you're not familiar with that um, kind of comprehensive term, that includes foster parents, foster to adopt families, and kinship care providers. Um, they are all critical partners for child welfare professionals because they provide care for children who cannot live with their parents. And they play a, they can play a supportive role in the achievement of whatever the permanent plan is. They are the ones who are there with the children and youth day in and day out. They are the ones who take them to school, take them to activities, appointments, and really are involved in every aspect of day-to-day -day life. They are the ones who witness the children and youth when they're having a good day, and, when, and they are their support when they're having a rough day. They are there to celebrate birthdays and other special occasions as a family. They are drying tears, making important decisions regarding everyday needs of the children and youth, and they ensure that the children and youth in their home feel safe and loved. With this wealth of knowledge, the resource families are the ones with the most and best first-hand knowledge of how the child or youth is really doing day to day. Um, and another kind of take on the term resource families is that they are both a resource for um, the whatever the permanent plan is, be it reunification, a resource for alternative permanent plans, um, and they are a resource for the success of the child or youth who is in their home. They can help the child youth um, develop even stronger relationships with key people in their lives. So they play a very important role in the children and youth who are served by the foster care system. And so it's easy to see with this firsthand knowledge of the child or youth in their home um, why they are such key players on the team working towards permanency. Um, when resource families and birth families connect through what's known as sh shared parenting, they can become a strong force in the achievement of reunification. Um, they can work together on case plans. They can do visits and appointments together, all of which contributes to successful reunifications. Even after reunification has taken place, the resource families can be additional support to the children, youth, and families. They truly set an example of how communities and people who care about one another can work together to take care of one another. 
They can minimize the separation and loss that the children and youth feel when they return home. If and when it's determined to not be in the best interest for the child and youth to return home, the resource families are often the next best option for offering and achieving permanency as well. And so all of this kind of leads to the information that judges need in order to make a, a good decision. And so as you all know, when parents are unable to take care of their children, courts rely on resource families to step in and keep the child um, safe. As previously mentioned, resource families are tasked with meeting the child's medical, mental health, dietary, and educational needs while also assisting with the permanency goal. Often these children and youth have been traumatized, placed in multiple homes and schools, or have special needs. The judges need good information in order to make good decisions for these children and their families. Resource families have the most detailed information about the child's needs, services, and daily progress. Ensuring notice is given to resource families for every hearing and allowing them to be heard in court enhances the judge's ability to make good decisions. Judges have tremendous influence over children and youth in the child welfare system. They have the authority to place a child or youth in foster care, and it ultimately falls to them to decide whether it's safe for a child to return home. Resource families have a true sense of the child or youth's emotional well-being at school, at home, and resource families can speak to how the child adjusts before and after visits with the biological parents. It is crucial for the child welfare system to review, to view resource families as partners with biological parents in the reunification process. The failure to have this recognition is really sabotaging efforts, which leads to more failed permanency efforts. Having them attend and participate in court is a step in this direction. Courts are responsible for ensuring that children's rights to safety, permanency, and well-being are being met in a timely and complete manner. How can courts, and specifically judges, how can they do that without seeing and hearing the valuable information from the resource families? Now that we've talked a little bit about why it is important to have resource families participate, I'm going to turn it over to Gail Corelli to tell us a little bit about what both federal and state law tells us about this practice. Gail? Yes, thank you, Arletta. In 1997, the federal government recognized the importance of the voice of resource families in hearings with the passage of the Adoption and Safe Families Act. This legislation required that those who are providing care for children and youth served by the foster care program are given notice of and have the right to be heard at any hearing for the child or youth. Under 42 U.S.C. section 675, 5G, states are required to institute case review procedures that assure that the foster parents of a child and any pre-adoptive parent or relative providing care for the child are provided notice of and a right to be heard in any hearing held with respect to the child. It's important to note that being given notice of and the right to be heard at a hearing does not equate with having the status of being a party to the case. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to North Carolina law. The people involved in a juvenile case have different status with the court, depending on their roles. Understanding notice starts with understanding how the law applies to the various people involved in a case. So when a petition is filed, as the uh, slide shows you, there's various paperwork um, that is filed along with the petition. And a summons is one of those things. Now, a summons is more than just notice. It's a command by the court for the person summoned to attend a hearing on a certain date, at a certain time, and at a certain location. Now, the UCCJEA, just I, I see I've got some acronyms in there, that stands for the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act. It helps the court determine whether or not the court has jurisdiction to hear the case. And SMCRA stands for Service Members Civil Relief Act. 
it informs the court whether or not any respondent in a, in a juvenile proceeding is an active duty service member in order to ensure that their rights are protected. Summons are directed at persons who are parties to a case. Party status affords individual and individual certain rights that go beyond notice and the opportunity to be heard. It allows such things as the presentation of evidence, questioning of witnesses, and receipt of discovery materials. Party status is very specifically outlined in the Juvenile Code in Section 7B 401.1. A guardian can be one who is appointed under Chapter 35A of the General Statutes. And generally speaking, juveniles appointed a guardian under 35A would not really have DSS involvement. The 7B600 guardian is the one who is appointed during the course of or at the conclusion of an abuse, neglect, and dependency case. So as an example, if the parents pass away and grandmother petitions the court for guardianship of her grandchildren under 35A, uh, 35A basically finds that uh, minors are legally incompetent to transact business or give consent for most purposes and need a responsible, accountable adult to handle property or benefits to which they are entitled. Parents are the natural guardians of the person of their minor children, but unemancipated minors, when they do not have natural guardians, need some other responsible, accountable adult to be responsible for their personal welfare and personal decision making on their behalf. So any person granted guardianship under this statute, 35A, or under 7B600 is automatically a party in any subsequent abuse, neglect, and dependency proceeding. Contrast this with custody, where the court will make a determination about the juvenile's permanent plan before according party status to a custodian. Caretakers are only made parties in the above circumstances. The petition alleges allegation or has allegations regarding the caretaker, status and obligations of a parent, and the court orders it. 401.1 specifies that a foster parent is defined by section 131D-10.2 of the of uh, the general statutes. So foster parent means any individual who is 21 years of age or older who is licensed by the state to provide foster care. This does not include resource parents or relatives who are not licensed. And status to file a TPR refers to one who has standing under Section 7B1103 to file a TPR. For example, the juvenile has resided with that person for a continuous period of two years preceding the filing of the petition, or one who has filed a petition for adoption under Chapter 48. In Chapter 7B, notice for resource families, including any non-party foster parent or person providing care for the juvenile, comes in at review and permanency planning. Notice is required under the law. See the word shall. It is not optional. Notice can be given to the caregiver by the clerk or by DSS. Remember, notice is not a summons, and it doesn't confer party rights. DSS is required to document that the caregiver was provided notice. When DSS provides notice, 7B906.1B mandates that written documentation of that notice that it was given must be filed with the clerk. There is no guidance in statute or rule that specifies what this documentation should look like, however. So how do we notify? Parties get a notice of hearing. There's an AOC form for that. And I'm going to briefly jump to the next slide and show it to you, AOC J141. That can be found on the internet. Um, and DSS can use a notice of hearing form. You could do it by a letter, an email, or a phone call. Uh, the last two might be a little bit more difficult to document, though. The important thing is to document the method and provide written documentation to the clerk. If clerks are providing notice, it's most likely that they are using the form, but you know, form is not the law. Just remember that. If you are unsure about how to accomplish notice, ask your attorney, ask your director. Practice differs greatly by judicial district, and your attorney, along with your director, can establish policy or procedures to ensure that the law is being followed. We do have some tips to offer, though, which Arlette will talk about a little bit later, sorry. So we're going to do a poll now. Um, who in your area provides notice? There it is. And if you all can just go ahead and take a minute and answer that for us.
And Gail, while you're waiting on answers to that question, I did forget to remind folks that uh, we do have a file share pod on the left that has forms in it, um, and the form that you just mentioned is in there, as well as slides and other handouts for this webinar. Looks like we're getting some answers in still. And it looks like, for the most part, it's either the permanency planning social worker or the juvenile court. Seems to be fairly evenly split there. Um, some just say the county child welfare agency. Other, not sure who other is, but anyway, thank you for those responses. And now Arletta is going to talk a little bit about the benefits. Thanks, Gail. So we frequently hear this saying, it takes a village. Um, but I really think it is true in the child welfare world. When resource families join with birth families, they can present and be seen as a united front on behalf of the children. Co-parenting, or as we know it in North Carolina, shared parenting, is really when um, resource families share the nurturing of a child or a youth served by the foster care program with the birth parents and the child's caseworker. Co-parenting is best for kids in foster care because they see the adults in their lives working together as a team and therefore they feel less divided by loyalty. Um, this position of the United Front removes the need for the child or youth to feel put in the middle. And it also provides resource families with the opportunity to model um, healthy skills and be cheerleaders for children, youth, and families. They can support both parents and the child or young person. If all of the adults can hear the same information about a child or youth in the same format at the same time, then they can make decisions about the best direction to move. And before we transition into how to make it happen, I believe we have one last poll question for y'all. Um, so it seems like you all are doing a, a pretty good job of providing notices um, to resource families, but just wanted to give you an opportunity if you're facing challenges, um, what are some of those challenges that you're experiencing? So it seems responses are coming in. Early data shows most of y'all weren't aware of this requirement to provide a notice. So hopefully we've met that goal today. Um, a few of you all don't know who the resource family is, so obviously that makes it a challenge to provide notice to them, as well as not knowing where to send the notice. Um, Nobody has uh, acknowledged or checked that they don't believe the resource family should participate, so that's another good news. Um, so one of the things as we move on, um, one of the things that, that I heard in preparing and recognizing the need for this webinar is that a lot of folks did recognize that this was a need. Um, but they just weren't sure how to make it happen. And so um, over the next few slides, we have um, some tips that we hope will make this a little bit more tangible to you and that you can put into your own practice. And the first one is obviously um, informing the clerk of any initial or subsequent placement changes um, within, say, seven days of the placement change. Um, and you see the sub bullet there is that um, you could develop a standard form so that when those placement changes happen, um, that can just be completed with the information for the resource family and provided to the clerk of court. Um, and you see the sub bullet there to 
that could be something that you take on in your district permanency collaboratives. And for those of you who may not be familiar with that concept of the district permanency collaborative, it's a fairly new initiative. It's, it's been um, started in the last year. And it's really where county child welfare and the courts come together to discuss and plan for how to achieve better outcomes for children, youth, and families served by the foster care system. Um, and so that is something you certainly could take on in the district permanency collaboratives for those of you who are involved in those initiatives. Um, and we also have there as a part of our tip um, some information that you would want to be sure that you include when you provide notice to the clerk, um, such as the identity of the resource family and contact information. And please note there that that information is kept confidential, including the parties to the case. This next slide shows you a sample of a written notice that um, a social worker could use, or if the clerk did not want to use the AOC notice of hearing, this is something else that they could be used. Again, this could be modified based on your location. And this um, sample, I know it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but again, you can find it in your handouts. Um, and it's a great resource that you can use with your resource families. The next tip is that um, courts that have juvenile jurisdiction can adopt a local rule that ensures that a foster parent, kinship care provider, or a prospective adoptive parent has the ability to provide meaningful information in the court process. Um, and then you see the sub-bullets there of um, other parts to a local rule that could be made and, and how to make it as specific as possible so that um, it can really be put into practice. And tip three is to develop a caregiver information form. And again, this is something that your district permanency collaborative could take on. Um, and really, the purpose of this is to convey information in the event that a resource um, parent is not able or is not comfortable speaking in court. Um, it really does provide them that opportunity. And so um, one of the things to keep in mind here is that participants all bring their views and, and lenses to most anything. That's just the way the world works. And so it's no different in court. And so in child welfare proceedings, there are many roles present. There's the agency. There's the guardian ad litem. There are the parents, the judges. Um, and the front of the courtroom can look packed. Um, and it would be easy to think that the child or use information could and would be shared through either the county child welfare agency's court report or that of the guardian ad litem. And of course, the, the parents are going to talk about how their children are, are doing and, and talk about getting them home. But however, in talking with juvenile court judges, both in North Carolina and across the country, they report the benefits of hearing directly from um, the folks that are providing ongoing care on a daily basis to the children and youth. And so um, judges, social workers, guardians ad litem, parents should all really encourage their resource families to attend and participate in court. And the last tip that I would like to share with you is that um, we spoke, in preparing for this webinar, we spoke with um, North Carolina Judicial um, District Court Judge Monica, Monica Bowsman, who is a, um, a lead abuse neglect dependency judge in District 10, which is Wake County. And she had a few key reminders that we'd also like to share in supporting resource families as they participate in court. Um, and Judge Bowsman said that in her experience, it's really helpful to encourage resource families to bring a journal, um, keep a journal, and bring it with them to court. Uh, to really kind of gather, before they come to court, really gather their thoughts and um, develop some talking points that when they get in front of the judge, that, that can be an intimidating position and they, it may be difficult for um, the resource families to talk off the top of their head and it's really helpful for them to have an outline of what they would want to share. And she also really um, encouraged that it was, um, 
beneficial for resource families to bring calendars with them to the hearing um, in case there's a question about a certain date of an appointment or a visit, things of that nature. And this is just a continuation of that tip um, that Judge Bowsman, again, in her experience, really felt it was helpful that um, in some instances, resource families are not going to feel comfortable speaking out. And it may be more appropriate for them if they would like to write a report or write a letter. Um, but keep in mind that anything that is written, such as a letter or a court report, um, must be shared with all the parties. So um, there'll need to be multiple copies of that. Um, and then um, just, again, highlighting the importance of keeping key happenings on a calendar. Um, and you see the sub-bullets there about phone calls to and from the parents, visits, missed visits, timing of, of nightmares, and just kind of some unusual behavior, and as well as um, key things that, that children say that judges um, may want to hear about. Um, so I think those are really helpful uh, tips. And we hope that you all see those as helpful um, and in support of um, establishing this practice in your agency and in your judicial district. And so um, as you know, we have two resource family representatives with us on the webinar today. And um, we thought it would be really helpful for the group to hear directly from them about your, their experiences in participating in court. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Barry to talk about his experience with um, receiving notice and participating in court. Barry? Thank you, Arletta. Uh, so my goal today is to share my experience uh, and help others understand what worked well in our experience and where there are possible improvement opportunities for the system to consider. My involvement with court systems involves four different areas. And so the first one is our notification from our local DSS. Notification of court hearings are a tremendous value to foster parents because we are able to schedule our day around our child's case. Our experience receiving notification has been overall pleasant. We regularly receive notification via mail a few weeks in advance. In our notification letter, we are given the information about the date, time, and location of our child's hearing. One item of information that would be incredibly beneficial to foster parents is if we could have an idea of when our case would be called. Uh, this leads me into my next point, which is the timeliness in court. This is an area that has been a little less consistent when compared to our notification of hearings. In our experience, our appointments in court have not started on time. This may not seem like an issue, but when court is scheduled to start at 9 o'clock and doesn't start until 9.35 or later, and your case may be towards the end of the agenda, it can quickly take up your whole day. Unfortunately, we have experienced this on several occasions. There have been times where we were not able to stay and hear our actual case involving our foster children due to time constraints. We feel it is vital to show representation for our child. Decisions are made in court that affect everyone involved with the children's lives, and it's incredibly important to be in attendance so that you are aware if any changes are made. Court is also a time to connect with biological parents and others involved in that particular case. We use this time for shared parenting and to further connect with biological parents about the well-being of their children. Thirdly, a, a lack of representation. So as a foster parent, sometimes the court process does not seem uh, set up to support hearing our input. In my experience, I have shared with social workers and their supervisors my experience with the children in our care. I know that some of this information is in the file and may end up in the court report that the social worker shares with the judge. However, there is not a clear process for foster parents to share directly with the courts. When we do attend court hearings, we are not often asked to share anything with the judge. Most often, the judge thumbs through the report and maybe ask a few questions that may or may not be directed to the foster parents. As a foster parent, I want to make sure that the judge has the information he or she needs about the total experience of the children when he is making uh, determinations for their care. 
Foster parents who are caring for the children every day hold a large chunk of the information the courts need about day-to-day -day life for these children. It is important that judges have access to the foster parents' information. And lastly, the lack of recognition. There are times in court where the judge has asked if the foster parents are present and has even asked them to come to the front as part of the case. There have been a few times, however, where we have not been recognized. We certainly did not get into fostering for the recognition, but do want to feel that our contribution is appreciated. Our role as foster parents is to care for the child and to help maintain connections to their family so that the children can eventually return home. This means that we are in the trenches with the family and the children trying to make things better for everyone involved. Being recognized by the courts for our commitment and work is important and reinforces that we are part of the team working to make sure that children are safe and that the families are healthy. With our common goal of providing the utmost care for our foster children and doing what is in the best interest for the child and family, I'm confident that we can work together to see changes made that will benefit everyone involved. Thanks, Barry. Hey, this is Gina. I wanted to tell you as a resource parent, a kinship provider, the court notification is very important. As we saw at the start of the presentation, it's important because it is important to the judge. Out of the five hearings I attended, I did receive an official court notice for three out of the five. Now, I was informed by our GAL for all five of the hearings, but that's not the formal process we should rely on. I was also informed once by our social worker for a hearing in which the youth needed to attend. At each of those five hearings, as the clerk took roll call, all the cases which had additional people, not just resource parents and foster parents, but non-custodial parents, and I remember a grandmother and an aunt, any case that had more than just the social services, the attorney, and the birth parents, all these other cases were heard first. The judge asked questions of all the attendees and finished each one by asking if there was any additional information that they wanted to share or add to the case. I don't think the judge would do that five different times if it wasn't something important that he felt strongly about and it wasn't information that he wanted to know. Also, the publication Fostering Perspectives, which is sponsored by the division, produced by UNC, Jordan Institute for Families, has covered this topic multiple times as far back as 2002. These articles showed the same per perspective and positive thoughts on caregiver attendance in the court. I have also read interviews with two judges in the same publication, one judge was from Buncombe County, the other one was from Wake. And I also found information that some states include court participation instructions as part of their fostering parent training. We all want judges to have the information that they need to make good decisions. And there's a different way to look at this also. An official court notice can be very useful to a resource parent. I know that in my case, as a kinship provider of an older youth, I worked for years at the same company, never asking for time off or anything child related, and then all of a sudden, like overnight, I have a special needs child. So when you're asking to use your sick time off from work for therapy appointments, doctor and orthodontist visits, child and family team meetings, etc., it's very nice to have that official notice in your hand. I want to thank you for letting me share my firsthand experience with you today. Thank you both to Barry and Gina for sharing that information. It's always wonderful to have that perspective um, added uh, when we're presenting information. So a few of the key takeaways before we get to questions. Uh, today we shared uh, the importance of providing notice of hearings in a timely manner, and we heard from you all on um, if you're aware of this policy or practice or not. Um, also, we heard the benefits of providing notice of hearings, and we heard directly uh, from some resource families. Uh, and then strategies for making this important practice happen. So since we just heard from uh, our resource families, I'm going to start our questions off um, by asking them um, how they prepared for court on the times that they uh, came to court. So I'll start with Gina. Hello again. 
Um, so the best way to prepare for court um, definitely would be to start in advance and to keep records and notes um, from the very start um, and keep a calendar on anything specific to do um, with your child or youth life. Um, you never know what might come up um, and you don't want to uh, have to rely on your memory uh, during court. And Barry, what would you add to that? Thank you, Gina. I would uh, just second everything that Gina said. Um, one thing that, or some things that we try to do as well, uh, we try to get to court early and uh, bring a calendar, as Gina was saying, just to make uh, note of any dates in the future that may come up in the in the the, the session. Uh, we try to sit near the agency uh, just in case we have any questions. You know, we have you know professionals right there in front of us that we can um, ask our questions to. And um, I, and this may not be the same in every county, but I know in some counties that court uh, for foster care and adoption and, and things of that nature is not always held in the same room. And so we try to get there early to make sure that we're in the, the right room at the right time uh, and also gives us an opportunity to interact with biological parents and other people that are involved in the case as well. All right, thank you. And I think it's important to, for us to keep this information in mind as we're uh, working to support resource families when they're coming to court. Uh, so not only making sure that they're you know, having that timely notice, but also uh, when they come, making sure that we're supporting them as well. Uh, so we're going to switch gears here a little bit um, and get to some of the questions that you all have been asking uh, throughout our time. Um, so the first one that I'll uh, start with uh, is, should resource families with a straight petition uh, receive notice of court hearings? Um, Raquel, do you mean, uh, I I'm going to go ahead and assume, because I can't have a dialogue with you, that you mean like a slow petition? That petition without non-secure um, and so the answer is yes because at some point you are going to get to review and permanency planning and you can start providing notice um, as soon as possible but you know the law our North Carolina law in 7b 906.1 says at review and permanency planning all right thank you Gail uh, so the next question I will get to. Can the AEOC J140 be used for court reviews and permanency planning hearings? And I guess that's me again. So <laughs> the AOC J140 is actually a motion for review. Um, normally you would file a notice of hearing along with a motion for review. So the motion for review in and of itself is not notice. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, normally whenever you're calendaring a case, assuming you didn't get your court date when you were at the previous hearing, when you calendar in a case, you're going to file a motion for review, and that notice of hearing is going to be attached to it. So yes, I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't use that. But again, like I said in my presentation, the practice differs by counties, and it's something you want to talk to your attorney and your and your director about how you all think it should be done. All right, so moving on, I think we initially thought that a lot of the questions would be uh, in Arletta's wheelhouse, but it seems that a lot of them are going to go to Gail. But Arletta, if you have anything you want to add, just, uh, just jump in. Um, so the next one is, um, it's a comment, but I think we get the question really behind it. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm the only clerk here. If the caregiver slash resource family members aren't official parties to the case, the clerk's hands are tied with notice and giving information. Gail, I know you mentioned you could speak to that. Yeah, um, so I'm not a clerk. I'm just a lawyer, and I can't tell you how to clerk. So <laughs> all I can say is um, I'm going to go ahead and just read this, so don't shoot the messenger, but 7B906.1, subsection B. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. Uh, the Director of Social Services shall make a timely request to the clerk to calendar each hearing at a session of court scheduled for the hearing of juvenile matters. 
the clerk shall give 15 days notice of the hearing and its purpose to one, the parents, two, the juvenile, if 12 years of age or more, three, the guardian, four, the person providing care for the juvenile, five, the custodian or agency with custody, six, the guardian ad litem, seven, any other person or agency the court may specify. The Department of Social Services shall either provide to the clerk the name and address of the person providing care for the juvenile for notice under this subsection, or file written documentation with the clerk that the juvenile's current care provider was sent notice of hearing. Nothing in this subsection shall be construed to make the person providing care for the juvenile a party to the proceeding solely based on receiving notice and the right to be heard. So that's the law. And actually, I can kind of keep reading and answer the next question, unless you want to go ahead and read it out. I have at it. Well, and Sorry. I was just going to chime in that um, in support of that, there are clerks across North Carolina who are providing official notice to resource families. And so there, as in the Gail just just read you the citation that supports that. And so um, maybe reach out um, to those uh, counties or those judicial districts to hear more about um, how they're how they're making that happen. But clearly that we have the the North Carolina general statute that supports um, that practice and endorses that practice. And Gail, if you wanted to go ahead to um, the next one, that's fine as well. Right. Um, so the question was, uh, we're often told that the resource uh, slash caregiver are not parties to the case. So information that they have to present often has to go through either DSS or the GAL. So I'm going to go back to 7B906.1 and this time subsection C that says, at each hearing, the court shall consider information from the parents, the juvenile, the guardian, any person providing care for the juvenile, the custodian or agency with custody, the guardian ad litem, and any other person or agency that will aid in the court's review. The court may consider any evidence, including hearsay evidence um, or testimony evidence from any person that is not a party if that the court finds to be relevant, reliable, and necessary to determine the needs of the juvenile and the most appropriate disposition. Having said that, I, I'll say it again, you sound like a broken record, but practice differs. Your judge may not want to hear directly from a resource parent. Um, you know, hopefully there can be some education there and, and you know, maybe things will change, but, uh, you know, you need to present information to the judge the way the judge wants to see it. So, um, but just so that you know, the law does provide and allow for the judge to hear anything that's going to help him or her make a decision about the juvenile. All right. Thank you, Gail. And I'll go ahead and answer a question that I know I can answer. It's not often I get one. Um, are we going to get the Q&A documents emailed to us after this training? Um, so the way the Q&A documents or the follow-up document will work um, is we'll, we'll have all the questions captured and we will send it um, to both Arletta and, and Gail and, and others to pull together the best answer for you. So it is not emailed directly after uh, the webinar, but you will uh, be sent the question and answer document and it also will be posted with the recording. Uh, the recording will be available earlier than the question and document, question and answer document, but we'll get that out to you um, as soon as possible. Um, we did have a few other questions that um, I believe are getting at um, very similar um, topics, um, but there is, um, I'll go ahead and ask this one. Um, so social workers never know when the case will be heard and whether or not the attorneys will be all present at the same time. So I will take that one. I'll take a stab at it anyway. Um, that That is a challenge that I'm recognizing and again preparing for this webinar um, that scheduling of court cases um, it's handled differently in all of the judicial districts and so um, I think Gina had some really good tips um, if you go back and um, look at her slide or, or re review what she said. Um, it may also be helpful to let resource families know that um, we don't know exactly when the case is going to be called and that you know they may end up sitting and, and waiting for a while just so they kind of know a little bit about what to expect in the process. Um, and 
if you do, if you are in a district that does block scheduling, for example, um, in that they, they know it's going to be held in the 9 to 11 um, chunk of time, certainly share that specific information um, with with the resource family so that they can plan accordingly. Um, and then one last thing that I may um, throw out there that I've heard, again, going back to the district permanency collaboratives, is that some, some districts are doing calendar calls a week or so in advance so that the parties know kind of an idea um, where there's going to be some perhaps consent whereas there may be some contested hearings. And that is helping um, the partners plan their, sched their court calendars more accordingly. So again, that could be something that your district permanency collaborative takes up um, or considers trying to get a little bit more specific. Um, so, but we know that that is a challenge. Um, and it's just something I think it's better just to convey that to the resource families so that they are aware that that is a possibility so that they can plan accordingly. All right, thank you, Arletta. Um, and we did cl have clarification that that was um, not necessarily a question, um, but a response into some of the dialogue we were having um, from Barry's. But I think it's great to have um, have that conversation and really think through how we can continue to plan for um, making sure that this important practice is is happening and the things that we can do to work to work together to help with this. Um, so we've had a few other questions that I believe are related to some we've already answered. Um, and then also there's some that uh, mention rules of record keeping um, that we are going to hold off on for now, uh, partially because we are not clerks and we want to make sure that um, we get the best answer to you. So that will be on the follow-up document. Um, but I do believe some of the information about the statutes that we've shared uh, may be helpful for that, um, but we will make sure we can work together to get an answer to you for those questions um, around rules of record keeping, just so we don't give you any misinformation. Um, so I, we do have a few more minutes. If there are other questions, um, I'll give you a few moments to type those in the chat pod. Um, and I'm going to take a second to read through, um, because I have not mastered the task of talking and reading at the same time. <laughs> All right, so I don't think we've had other questions uh, come up yet. Um, just a few other comments, just kind of seconding some of the information that we've um, shared. So if you do have another question, feel free to add it into um, the chat pod. And again, we will uh, make sure that we get the questions and answers out to you in the follow-up document. Um, and we'll have quite a few people coming together to bring you the best information to be able to answer your questions. And that'll be posted with the recording as well as emailed to all uh, participants. Um, if you do have other questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. But I am going to go ahead and proceed because it doesn't look like uh, anyone is currently typing. Um, so there is one thing that I would like you to answer. Um, and you can just answer by using the chat pod. Um, and that's what's one thing you will do in response to what you have learned today. So we would love to hear uh, from everyone on kind of next steps on what you'll do with this information. So I'll give you all time to answer that question for us. So it's like quite a few people are going to take this information and share it either with supervisors or the agency attorney, uh, various people. And I think that's a great first step is to uh, communicate and see what we can do to work together and get on the same page. Um, and also, uh, someone mentioned that they will um, continue to have their foster parents use um, letters to communicate um, and share information in court.
and some people you were able to confirm that you know you are um, able to notify resource parents in a timely manner and maybe you also learned um, a few other tips while you were here to help continue with that uh, supportive practice. All right, you can continue typing those in there. We also capture all of that information.